Hello, Internet, and welcome to another Wednesday Serial. I'm excited to get back to this today. I'm refreshing my opinion, though maybe not much of a refresh. Today, I'm talking and continuing with Green Lantern Rebirth. So, I wanted to say that this is one I've been meaning to do for a good long while. However, I couldn't because my package was in transit for basically the entirety of the month so this was something i've been meaning to do and could now i could have but this is obviously in keeping with my continuation of going through green lantern and this was the next point i do have a trade it is sitting right back there behind that green lantern one that's pulled out I, however, really wanted to read the issues, A, because I had just bought them, so I was excited to go through it and read it in issues, uh, but also just to read this again, because this is something I haven't read since I initially jumped on Green Lantern many years ago. So initially, I was hoping that this would be a good kind of follow-up to kind of mix in with that astonishing video I just did, and to continue my Green Lantern talk. Um, however, I don't have much of a new opinion about Rebirth this time because in reading it I realized I didn't remember it too well. Like, I remember a few scenes, a few moments, a few frames, but, but in reading it I understood why so much of it slid from my memory is that going into this thing, if you don't know where Green Lantern has been, this is a giant question box. And when I read Green Lantern Rebirth, um, I had read a few DC moments, um, I had read some Birds of Prey, a little bit of Superman, a little bit of Batman, because you end up without and you read comics, but I didn't know about Green Lantern, I didn't know a Hal Jordan from a Kyle Rayner from a Guy Gardner, what's a warrior, Jon Stewart, I recognized him because I had seen the cartoon, so this was not going to make sense to me when I read it initially, and, um, so I, I don't feel like there's much of an opinion to go back to or some, uh, something to mine other than I read through this and became a bit more familiar with characters that uh, ultimately I was learning at the time. All right, so in our first issue, uh, we deal a lot with Hal being the specter at the time as reference, you know, cover-wise. Uh, we get a bit on where Guy has been, we get a little bit about um, John and where he's been, but it, it, whereas it becomes important to the plot that he's kind of the Justice League Green Lantern, it's not really explicitly stated, which is super weird. There's a lot in this first issue, especially, that really assumes you've been more or less in the mean of what's been going on. And considering this ended up being and was advertised to be so and rightfully should be kind of a reintroduction for people to Green Lantern if not an introduction this is a bad book for it <laughs> um it, it so much of the reason why I don't remember is because of stuff like this like it's referencing Guy Gardner as the word, which was his status quo and they have to fix it, but I mean it's introducing Hal as the Spectre and playing with some of the Parallax stuff, but if you didn't know what that was, they don't really give you a great rehash here. Like, you get the Spectre of what's going on, but not really. And so you get these little snippets of where these characters are in the moment with setup for drama to come, kind of sans John, who's more or less just along for the ride. Uh, and I don't know, it's not great. And it's especially hard for people who are, you know, contemporary Green Lantern fans who maybe haven't been with the book for over a decade at this point. Especially because when this came out, reaching back for older stories was more of a deal than it is in today's landscape very likely maybe they read the parallax story in a trade if they were more dedicated fans but uh even then that's a bigger reach than it is now especially because i don't believe that trade was super cheap uh so i, I don't know it, it's kind of crazy and kyle 
Kyle gets a bad, bad introduction here. Basically, we get him at the beginning of the book. He crash lands on Earth in a spaceship, a big green spaceship, kind of like Abin Sur so many years ago, and we don't know. And that's the thing is we have all these little plot threads with characters, but we don't, we don't have enough to really chew on, anticipate, guess for the next month. And so that's kind of frustrating. Uh, it, it's funny coming back to this Jeff John story now after being so hailed and this being one of, you know, his supposed masterpieces and reading this first issue and thinking, if that's all I had, I might have slid off. Uh, what really sets this apart from other comics at the time, oof. what really sets this apart from comics at the time is Ethan Van Skyver, douchebag personified. I, I, uh, I don't want to dig into it. If you don't know, hit me up. I'll find a way to send you some articles or something. Uh, but he, his art skews more realistic here, which is super weird because I've seen so much of his art now. Things from his sketchbook, um, things from Cyberfrog, because uh, I think we've all, whether we want to or not, seen a few pages of that. And that's so wild and kind of weird for liking or lumping it. It's very different than here, which use more realistic but realistic uh it, it's not perfect anatomy there's bizarre muscles that like don't exist here there's um kind of a method and mold to how the characters look they're very kind of wrinkled not quietly wrinkled but wrinkled it and the book's very dark I, and I, I think that's because knowing and having seen a chunk of Ethan's work I'm pretty sure that especially because he wasn't a known quantity here this was his big kind of breakout book um, the inker and the color were kind of whether it was in burden or what they felt their job was or whatever it was um, definitely put in work good or ill to make Ethan's pencils look more in line with something closer to how most DC comics looked at the time. And so it ends with the atmosphere being very dark. There's a lot of just ink and black and dark on the pages in this comic, which gives it a horror vibe, which ends up fitting where we're going. So the art is something to take in and something to maybe have mixed feelings about but as we're finding out a lot right now there's a lot of creators with various dubious intents and it's hardly the first high profile case that's happened throughout my green lantern run so hooray issue two um plot overview wise is going to sound like a lot but there's a lot to um the specter coming in and coast city being partially rebuilt Hal's apartment the airway things important to Hal kind of crop up and uh Carol is back and a little bit here and there uh and a lot of this alerts people in the Justice League and we also get the few players from the Green Lantern core that are relevant to kind of start to step in and so at this point the plot takes some motion and there's some conflict but it ends up not really being the conflict of the book but but we're starting to get some tension and we do get a bit of batman in particular being the kind of antagonist within the jla to green lantern which is they make it work i guess and batman is basically completely in shadow in this book so they want to deal with Batman without kind of highlighting him too much. It's an interesting play, but frustrating in some ways because part of the reason to enjoy Green Lantern is to get the frick away from the bat. Issue three really 
starts to move. You'd hope so, right? <laughs> We're halfway through. Um, we get a lot of play on the idea of parallax and a bit of this backstory of it being the impurity that was trapped within the central bat battery that happened, you know, forever ago. Um, and that explains the problem with yellow with the ring. So we're kind of retrofitting. It's technically a rewrite, but it, it fits. And I think this is the magic and kind of the highlight and why the sort of things that John's are fans know and love and I think a high point to his writing is he's able to take various continuity points and kind of weave and mold them together so that they fit and uh, make comics continuity a take some of the silly stuff and give it a little more gravitas and also b just make it kind of work together in ways that you wouldn't think like you because normally if you had a story here that's trying to bring Hal Jordan back and bring kind of back the glory days of Green Lantern, you'd kind of be retconning and pushing things aside. You'd see kind of a force to forget certain elements, kind of a brand new day situation, or maybe um, something from one of DC's many resets. In this case, Johns takes it all in, mixes the pot, and gives us something new to spring off of. And I mean, as much as issue one wasn't so great, issue three is where you start to see kind of the genius behind it and what made this book what it was and made this relaunch into the high point of Green Lantern ever in comics, as far as I know. Don't get me wrong, it's a prominent book, but I mean, this was the point where Green Lantern was one of DC's top books, which it certainly wasn't before, and really hasn't been again after Johns has left. Don't get me wrong, I'm looking forward to reading some of it and I've heard some good things, but it's it's a B book. Um, this issue ends with Sinestro showing up. And what's funny is Sinestro shows up and there's not a lot of explanation through it, even as we continue forward. Um, but it doesn't feel necessary, really, because with some of the things going on, you can kind of no prize your way into why Sinestro came back. And uh, doesn't really need to be overly explained. Um, here we get, I don't want to say metatextual, but maybe a bit more to the idea now. I didn't read Final Night, but that's when Hal was kind of put down, moved to the Spectre. So there's this feeling, this need to have Green Arrow there, which he's been throughout the story. He's actually a fairly prominent player, and he's working with Kyle to try to figure out what's going on. Obviously, all signs are pointing to Hal, and now they're dealing with Sinestro. Um, and there's a lot in this issue in particular that what Johns is trying to point out to the greater mythos is that to wield one of these rings does require a special person. Green Arrow is a very competent, very driven person, but he has to use one of the rings to get out of the situation. He basically takes all of his energy, all of his will to form like a little oversized arrow that sticks into Sinestro. Maybe it's supposed to be a normal size. It was oversized. Uh, and he's winded after it and talking about like how he feels like you know he's done for the day basically and he turns to Kyle and he's like is that what it's like and Kyle's like every time kind of made me think of um, a moment in the X-Men when uh, I think it's Rogue takes Wolverine's powers and pops the claws she's like that hurts she's like is that what happens to you and he's like every time uh it, it just kind of made me think that they're trying to play it up but you never really address it again necessarily so i don't know it, it's a fun little bit and we end on the casket with hell's body that's been brought from oa because of the guardians being there but they talk about the guardians but it's really gant that they don't explain any of this i am able to access that and try to figure out the significance when we actually see more guardians and see some female guardians and whatnot um, and understand the importance of that but 
hear when they're talking about the core, they don't talk about it like the core ended, really. They, they don't talk about the Guardians coming back after being nearly extinct. They don't talk about much. They talk about Kyle being the torchbearer, and so he kept it going. But what that means, if you don't know, I can attest to this. It sounds different. It sounds like he's kind of leading the cores and had a ragtag group, which is where the book ends with Kyle's run, but isn't what it is throughout the majority of the time. And dealing with Ganthet and the fact that he's familiar with Ganthet is kind of weird still. I know he's had a few moments with Ganthet at this point, but through a majority of the run, he's just on his own uh they give him some crud for being the torchbearer but being inexperienced or whatever but I, I still uh feel like i'm defending kyle or whatever but it's weird because uh he he is left to his own devices completely so i don't know all right so in this one, we kind of get the Sinestro Hal fight, cover says. And, I don't know, they're just kind of going at it. Wada Wada, they kind of rehash their meeting, which is different than what it is in uh, Emerald Dawn, but not so much that it really matters. Uh, so, I don't know, the story is there. And it, what's funny is they talk about Kyle. How is Sinestro even aware of Kyle, though? Like, his being reborn, fine, but that raises questions that he has consciousness of what's been happening while he was out, uh, <laughs> however you want to interpret that. Because uh, he's been gone, dead, finito, uh, and now he's back and he's aware of Kyle? I, it's weird. Um, but Hal's aware of Kyle because he's run into him a handful of times. And Sinestro refers to him as the street rat, which is weird, demeaning, fits Sinestro, I guess. Then uh, Hal's referring to him as like the torchbearer. And that's something as a lot of the main Green Lanterns get their cute little titles. Um, but Hal's the greatest Green Lantern, which is something that always bugged me because he's not... He has a spotty record. I don't think that's hard to say. So, I don't know. They, they also make a point of Kyle kind of looking up to Hal, talking about how he's the greatest who ever was, and so kind of in this boyish bit where he, he's kind of still looking up to Hal and whatnot, which is hard to read. Because as much as Hal coming back and all that's fine, I understand where the book's going, fine 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 kyle can work with him now that he's a green lantern again and doing the right thing that makes sense because kyle has worked with him when he was in his more or less prime uh with the time travel shenanigans but the idea that kyle wouldn't meet him as an equal at this point belies the past three creators on the book like we're talking about years of continuity at this point where he had moved past that and stated that multiple times and so it's a little frustrating that they kind of revert kyle to kind of where he was during the tail end of the mars run it's it's a little hard and then issue six um, what's kind of cool about this is, it, I mean, this is Hal's rebirth, but at this point he's reborn, he's there. And what we're doing is fighting Parallax. Now, the reason Hal is able to resurrect is because the body is there. And then his spirit is split from the sector, Spectre, who's been working on or is now aware of Parallax. And because of that, these two entities merging with this one mortal soul kind of causes a schism. So basically the Spectre splits, gives Hal some exposition, and is off to go back to being the Spectre. I, I, I forget if they go right away to who's on it next, or if they let that linger for a while. And, uh, and then we have Parallax floating. 
And so now we get Parallax as we'll know him moving forward instead of as the monstrous Hal that's been projected with the weird shoulder pads and whatnot, that costume that we've seen in the prior run now with like fangs and all that. Uh, we see Parallax as the giant yellow wormy monster thing. Uh, and we get our earth lanterns and kill a log to fend it off and there's a kind of fun moment where they're basically all just green lanterning at parallax and the reason it loses is because everything's there i guess but it, there's little detail about each character and kind of how they use the ring and what's kind of cool about that is it's john's kind of portraying that they all use a little bit differently, but it's a tool, and so their personality and utility comes out, and each one kind of has a way with it. And I, I, I think it's fun, it's interesting, but this ends very much on, and the adventure continues, as it rightfully should. This is just supposed to be a foothold moment to move forward into a new status quo for the book. Um, as far as that kind of a move, I think the only one that's ended up being stronger than this for a book overall that I can think of in the history of comics. I mean, obviously you have your Brian Superman that's up there, but I feel like it's good. I don't think it's as strong or as this bold of a move because I mean, this, that, that was Superman moving into its next leg. Uh, this took Green Lantern to heights, uh, and I, I believe Hoxpox is the one that is maybe done better. I, I don't think you can deny that the X-Men were kind of languishing, and now all of a sudden they're the hottest book on the market. Um, see how that opinion fares over time, but as of right now, that's where I'd say. And I just wanted to mention around this time, there's this little Secrets 2005 book that's a, primarily a Darwin Cook story about Hal Jordan uh, with his father and learning about his love of flying and it's it's a good little companion piece this is a cool comic worth picking up so yeah I mean I, I don't ratings don't make sense. I mean, you guys have heard about this book, if nothing else, and I'm excited to kind of get to the John stuff and curious to hear what you guys think about Green Lantern and whatnot, but yeah, glad to finally read this again.